Hello, everybody. We will continue talking about arguments in this lecture, particularly reconstructing them and turning them into that standard form bullet point format in order to better analyze whether or not the arguments are valid and sound. And it'll be important as we move forward to also talk about necessary and sufficient conditions as it relates to conditional statements. Just a quick recap from last time. We looked at the difference between propositions and uh, statements. Uh, the idea that propositions are in fact statements that have a truth value. Uh, these are the things that make up arguments. Uh, but of course, we need to distinct, uh, distinguish those from statements that are not propositions, such as questions or um, orders, uh, things like that. We also looked at arguments and how arguments must contain two propositions at the very least, whereby one is a premise and the other is a conclusion. And then we looked at the two ways of evaluating arguments uh, that we're going to focus on in this class, both validity and soundness, validity, the argument's structure, whether the conclusion is inferred by the premises and the soundness, whether or not uh, the argument is valid and all of the premises are true. When looking at arguments, however, they don't come in that neat standard form bullet point package. Uh, they're written in paragraph form like the paragraph you see here. Brittany is up to something. I know it. It's easy to tell. If she locks herself away in a room like that, it means either she's got a deadline or she's up to something. And I know she hasn't got a deadline, so there's something fishy going on. This is how we might read an argument in real life. And so it's up to us to take something like this and put it into that bullet point form. Because when, once it's in the bullet point form, once it's in standard form, we're, be able, we're better able to evaluate whether or not the premises and further conclusion and whether the premises are in fact true. And so we need to focus our attentions uh, on taking an argument and turning it into standard form. Uh, this is what we call reconstructing an argument. Now, it's often the case that we might not necessarily need to reconstruct arguments. However, most arguments that you see in real life are, are very convoluted and complicated. And so it'll typically make things much easier if we can get them from paragraph form into standard form. And so there's six steps to doing this. First, we need to separate out different arguments, make sure that we're focusing on one argument at a time, and then identify the premises and conclusion to that argument. After that, we need to make sure that we're turning all the sentences into propositions. And this is helpful because in English, it's often the case that we use rhetorical questions or uh, orders as propositions even though they don't really have a truth value. And so we need to make sure that we're getting anything that has meaning and relevance into the argument in proposition form. After that, we cut away all the waffle, all the BS stuff that we don't need, the just fluff of the paragraph that has no bearing on the argument, and then fill in any missing premises or conclusions that were perhaps too obvious for the speaker or writer to have to put into the argument. Lastly, we'll need to disambiguate the language of the argument, making sure that all of the terminology is consistent and that the argument makes sense using uh, the terminology that is used. Now, in this lecture, we will go through each one of these steps in turn uh, to practice and see how, in fact, we go about reconstructing the argument in each step. So here we have a paragraph taken from Joseph Chamberlain's speech, uh, Attacking Free Trade. Now, this is just a paragraph 
from that speech. However, within it contains multiple different arguments. And it's important for us moving forward to be able to focus on one argument at a time. Now, in the real world, arguments are going to come at you uh, very quickly. And it'll be up to us to identify the individual arguments. So in this one paragraph, we can see that Chamberlain is making three different arguments. The first is that uh, you cannot go on replacing industry with industry forever. The next, that when one industry goes, others may not take its place. And the third, the replacement of one industry with others causes suffering to workers. Each of these points is its own argument and requires premises of its own in order to prove it. Now, this is just in this one paragraph. Imagine if you're listening to a politician or a newscaster speak for an hour. There will no doubt be multiple, multiple arguments that need to be identified and taken one at a time in order to determine if it is a good or a bad argument. Now, for the purposes of this course, you will never really have to do this. I'll only ever present you with one argument at a time. And so we can kind of skip this first step. It is important to know, however, that in the real world, you will have to do this. And so it's important to practice this when watching television, watching the news, listening to uh, politicians speak or reading the news or listening to family or friends or teachers speak. It's important to focus on one argument at a time and not confuse different arguments with each other. If I were to look at this uh, one, two, three list uh, at the bottom of this page and think that one and two are just premises to the conclusion three, it would make for a bad argument. And so I might be inclined to not believe what's being said, not be persuaded by what's being said, despite the fact that a better or actual good argument is being made for number three and two and one individually. This is where we'll first begin, identifying premises and conclusions. Now, the list in front of you indicates a bank of words that typically show a premise. So anything following these phrases or words will indicate that you are about to read a premise or reason for an argument. Take for instance the word because. When reading a paragraph, when you see the word because, what comes before because is often the conclusion to an argument, and what comes after because are the reasons. Same with since, for, in view of, assuming that, all of these phrases or words. These are helpful indicators for premises. This list, on the other hand, are indicator words for conclusions. So when we see the word therefore or thus shows that or demonstrates that, we are reading a word that indicates that what follows will be the conclusion to an argument. And if what follows will be the conclusion, what comes before will be a premise. When we look at this argument, what jumps out at you for being the conclusion and what jumps out as being the premise. It's often helpful to find the conclusion first as it is the main thing that's trying to be proven in the argument. So when you think about what the argument is trying to tell you, you will typically find the conclusion. So if my argument says you've got to vote independent in the next election, the Republican Party is in shambles and the Democrats are sellouts, it is the first sentence, you've got to vote independent in the election, that is the conclusion to this argument. If that is the conclusion, then what follows will be the premises, so our argument looks like this. 
Now, once we indicate the premises and conclusions, it's important to note any phrases or sentences that are not propositions, but essentially are trying to get us to believe something. Take this argument, for instance. Are you seriously voting for Trump? The man's an idiot. When we think about what the conclusion is, it's difficult to see. But the conclusion is the first sentence. Are you seriously voting for Trump? The problem with this is that that is a question and not an assertion. We need to therefore take this rhetorical question and turn it into a proposition how the writer might be intending it to be used. So when we think of the conclusion, are you seriously voting for Trump, the propositional form of this is a little something like, you should not vote for Trump. The reason for this conclusion is the second sentence, the man's an idiot. So the Trump is an idiot, therefore you should not vote for Trump. It's important that we're reading what the author or speaker is saying and intending, and if they're using phrases like rhetorical questions, if they're giving orders, but that order is something that should be focused on in terms of an assertion or proposition, then we will need to change it into such. How about this argument? Don't feed the dog again. He's already eaten more than enough. What is the conclusion to this argument? The conclusion, once again, is the first sentence. But the first sentence is an order, not a proposition. There is no truth value to the phrase, don't feed the dog again. In English, however, if we say this, it'll typically mean something else that does have a propositional value. For instance, the dog should not be fed again. This, this statement does have a truth value, and so is a proposition. The reason we should not feed the dog again is because if the dog has eaten more than enough, he should not be fed again. And we know by the second sentence, the dog has eaten more than enough. It's therefore important that we're taking all of these sentences that we can manipulate using the English language and make them into propositions if they are important for the argument. Step four, cutting out all the waffle, getting rid of all the extra BS. Look at this argument again. Brittany's up to something, I know it. It's easy to tell. If she locks herself away in a room like that, it means either she's got a deadline or she's up to something. And I know she hasn't got a deadline, so there's something fishy going on. Now, first and foremost, we want to find out what the conclusion is, because the conclusion is often easiest to find first. In this argument, the conclusion is the first sentence. Brittany is up to something. Now that we have the conclusion, we can cut out all the extra BS to narrow down what our premises are. In this argument, there are a couple parts that are unnecessary. I know it, it's easy to tell, so there's something fishy going on. These are aspects of the argument that have no bearing on the argument. These are just words that are written that serve no real purpose. So what we're left with is our conclusion, Brittany's up to something, and the rest are premises. If she locks herself away in a room like that, it means either she's got a deadline or she's up to something, and I know she's got a deadline. This is how we would write the argument in standard form. Now with the argument in standard form, we're able to determine whether or not it's valid or sound based on how the premises work together to infer the conclusion. Step five, fill in missing premises and conclusions. Now, this is an important aspect when reconstructing an argument because it can often be where arguments are made or when arguments go bad. 
Sometimes when we leave out premises or conclusions, we do so because they're so obvious they don't need to be stated. But when we're putting our arguments into standard form, we need to make sure that everything that is obvious is stated so we can determine whether or not the premises infer the conclusion. Sometimes, however, we'll leave out premises or a conclusion because it's obviously false and we do so to trick the person we're speaking with or writing for to believe us. And so we'll leave something out because it's damning to our argument. Take the argument we just looked at. If Brittany locks herself away in a room, it means either she's got a deadline or she's up to something. She hasn't got a deadline, therefore she's up to something. Now, embedded in this argument is a premise that is obvious but necessary when writing the argument in standard form. I'll give you a minute to think of what that premise might be. The premise that is missing here is that she has locked herself away in a room. Remember, the first proposition is a conditional statement, an if-then statement. So there's a hypothetical of if she locks herself away in a room. If we don't know she's locked herself away in a room, then nothing else that follows ought to be the case. And so it's necessary for us to determine that first she's locked herself away in a room, and then that she has not got a deadline. By using all three of these propositions, we can conclude that she is definitely up to something. Remember, pretend the premises are true and ask yourself, can we deny the conclusion? If you cannot deny the conclusion and you are forced into believing it, the argument is valid. If you can think of a way to deny the conclusion, then it is invalid. Once the argument is valid, we ask ourselves if the premises are all true. If they are, then we have a sound argument on our hands. If there is an obvious false premise, then the argument is valid, but unsound. What about this argument that we looked at earlier? Trump is an idiot. You should not vote for Trump in the primaries. This is an argument where I'm leaving out a premise it is in fact damning to the argument. It might sound as though the first premise, or the only premise in this case, leads me to believe the conclusion. However, I can accept the first premise and deny the conclusion here. The reason being is because there's nothing saying that I should not vote for an idiot. Perhaps in the original argument, I want to vote for Trump because I do want to vote for an idiot for some reason. Perhaps I'm a large oil tycoon and I want there to be someone who's going to be ignorant of everything that I'm doing or my industry so that I can get away uh, with doing uh, perhaps uh, activities that are bad for the environment or unethical or whatever. Maybe I think that all of the candidates are idiots, so I'm going to vote for one anyway. It's not quite clear until you add that second premise that there's obviously something wrong in this argument. So when we see the argument actually written there when we fill in the premises, Trump is an idiot, you should not vote for an idiot, you should not vote for Trump in the primaries, we see that the argument is valid, but it is not sound. In the original argument, Trump is an idiot, you should not vote for Trump in the primaries, this argument may sound more appealing to some of you, but this is an invalid argument and therefore not a good one. Here, the Republican Party is in shambles, Democrats are sellouts, you should vote independent in the next election. We see here that we're missing something that tells us about the independent party and the Republican and Democratic Party that needs to be in with the premises. For instance, something along the lines of, if you don't vote for Democrats or the Republicans, you should vote independent in the next election. Uh, but here again, we see that three is problematic. Just because I don't vote for the Democrats or the Republicans doesn't mean I should vote necessarily for the independent party. 
Maybe I want to vote for the Green Party. Maybe I want to vote for the Communist Party. Maybe I don't want to vote at all. When we add in missing premises to make the argument better structurally, it can sometimes make the argument much worse. Notice how when we're adding in these premises, though, we're making the arguments valid. When making a valid argument on your own, it's important that you're using the same terminology in your premises that you're using in the conclusion. It's often the case that every word present in your conclusion will need to be present in your premises for the argument to be valid. Because if the argument is valid, it means your premises infer the conclusion. And premises cannot infer the conclusion unless they are using the terminology that appears in your conclusion. Sometimes, rather than premises being missing, the conclusion is missing. Take this argument. It's sunny and I never miss an opportunity to sunbathe, said by someone as he picks up his sunbathing mat and heads to the door. Here, we see that not only is a premise missing, but the conclusion is missing, right? When it's sunny, I sunbathe, which is just a uh, take on the phrase, I never miss an opportunity to sunbathe. The first part of the sentence says it's sunny. So now we have two premises that say it is sunny and whenever it's sunny, I sunbathe. What's missing, obviously, is the fact that I am going sunbathing. Now, in this argument, my actions make up the conclusion. My taking my sunbathing mat and heading to the door is an obvious sign that I'm going sunbathing. Now, sometimes both premises and conclusions can be missing. If we, the UK, do not hand over Julian Assange, we will strain the goodwill of America. Now, just a little background, Julian Assange uh, is the WikiLeaks guy, uh, created this uh, website that divulges American secrets, and he is wanted by the American government. And so the UK, who has an extradition treaty with the United States, is deciding that if we do not hand over Julian Assange, we will strain the goodwill of America. So the argument at hand, based on this one proposition, is that if we do not hand over Julian Assange, we will strain the goodwill of America. We should do nothing that strains the goodwill of America, because obviously the UK is America's ally. Therefore, we should hand over Julian Assange. It's important to know that arguments can be expressed in different ways. And so when we use rhetorical questions, when we provide missing pieces, arguments can still be expressed. And it's up to us to help make the arguments as strong as possible. Something that we'll talk about a little bit more here in a little bit. The last step to reconstructing an argument is to disambiguate all of the uh, ambiguities that are present within the terminology of the argument. Take this argument, for instance. If you are good, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good. Tom Brady will be rewarded by God. Tom Brady, obviously, the quarterback of the New England Patriots. Now, you see that there's a problem in this argument, and the problem is the word good. In the first premise, it seems to refer to something different than what it refers to in the second premise. If you were good, God will reward you. We would typically take the word good here to be something of moral standing. If you were good morally, God will reward you. However, in the second premise, it just says Tom Brady is good, which often implies he is good at football. So if we were to look at this argument by clarifying the terminology, we would see that if you are good morally, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good at football. Tom Brady will be rewarded by God. This second argument is 
clearly invalid and is therefore a bad argument. Now the problem that we run into, however, is this problem with whether or not we're doing justice to the definition of the terms. Take, for instance, this argument. All philosophers love wisdom. My philosophy professor does not love wisdom. My philosophy professor is not a, philosoph uh, not a philosopher. Again, here philosopher and philosophy professor mean something very different. All philosophers love wisdom can be taken to be all philosophers. In the Greek, the word philosopher means lover of wisdom, while in the second premise, philosophy professor is, makes reference to a job title. So if all philosophy, uh, if all philosophers love wisdom and my philosophy professor does not love wisdom, my philosophy professor is not a philosopher. By clarifying the terminology, we can see that the argument, the second argument, is a good argument, while the first argument is very confusing. This brings us to the idea of the principle of charity. Now, it's important, not just in this class, but for your life, that you are being charitable of the arguments that you are listening to or reading. This means that you are doing your best to try and help the person making the argument to make the best arguments that they can. Remember, when we argue, it's not to win. It's not to bicker back and forth. It's to get it some higher truth or better understanding. And so if we are levying our argument or counter argument against a very weak argument, then we are not doing anything to get us closer to understanding the truth or the other person's position. Instead, we should be trying to help the person make the best argument they can so that our objection will need to be the best objection it could be to determine whether or not the argument is in fact good or bad. Because remember, ultimately, we are trying to better understand and get at the truth. Take this argument again. If you are good, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good. Tom Brady will be rewarded by God. Reading this argument and trying to disambiguate the terminology, I might think that this following argument is how it would be best represented. If you are good morally, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good at football. Tom Brady will be rewarded by God. This, of course, is an invalid argument, however, and is therefore a conversation stopper. Because it's invalid, it's automatically bad, we don't need to pay any attention to it. But there are other ways to disambiguate. Take these two alternatives. If you are good in any respect, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good at football. Tom Brady will be rewarded by God. Here we have a valid argument that we can at least have a conversation about. However, the first premise is absolutely crazy. If you are good in any respect, God will reward you. I don't think that's the case. If you are good at murdering and stealing, God will open up those pearly gates. I would think that that first premise is going to be false. So while this argument is valid, it goes wrong uh, in its soundness. Now, I can think of this argument in this way. If you are good morally, God will reward you. Tom Brady is good morally. Therefore, Tom Brady will be rewarded by God rewarded by God by being a good football player. Here we have premises that sound more in line with reality and a conclusion that makes a bit more sense given the premises. Now, of course, we would still have to debate the idea of God and how God intervenes in lives. We might have to debate Tom Brady's goodness. Maybe he's not good morally, right? He deflated those footballs. And so he's a cheater, so he's not good morally. However, in this last argument, we can actually have a conversation rather than being instantly cut off by obviously false premises, uh, such as in the case above, or the invalid argument in the case of the argument on the previous page. We want to make sure that we're making the argument as strong as possible. 
It's our goal to get at the truth. And so we should have the best on both sides. So obviously you will not be pairing up with your neighbor since this is an online course. However, what I'd like you to do is try to reconstruct this argument. If you want to listen to loud music, do it when we're not at home. It disturb, disturbs us and we're your parents. Take this argument and put it into standard form. You should have bullets where the bottommost bullet is the conclusion. So now, please pause the video and work on reconstructing this argument. After working on this argument, you should have come up with something similar to what I have here. It may not identically resemble my argument, but this is essentially how this argument is reconstructed. The conclusion, you should not listen to loud music when we're at home. Why should you not listen to loud music when we're at home? Because listening to loud music when we're at home disturbs us and you should not do things that disturb us because we are your parents and because you should not do things that disturb your parents. By believing one and two, you are guaranteed three, which is your sub-conclusion. And then by entering in four, you can be guaranteed your final conclusion that you should not listen to loud music when we're at home. Now it is important uh, that we get some of this correct. Obviously the jump from we to us is important because it's important that the speaker be the parent. Also, it's important that your conclusion say something along the lines of you should not listen to loud music when we are at home instead of the proposition that you should listen to loud music when we are not at home. If I were to say something along the lines of you should listen to loud music when we're not at home, this is essentially an order given by a parent. Imagine your uh, mother or father going out to go grocery shopping. You tell them that you are going to do some homework and they say, no, you should listen to loud music when we're at home, when we're not at home. It doesn't have the same meaning as you should not listen to loud music when we're at home. There is an implication that makes this proposition different. And so we want to make sure that we're making it as strong as possible here, given the information. Now, this, of course, is going to be a difficult aspect of this course. You're being asked to fill in missing premises and provide this principle of charity to arguments. But at the same time, it's important that you're not putting words into the mouth of the writer or speaker. You are trying to stay true to the argument, but trying to make the best argument possible. And this is a fine line that we're going to have to walk in this class and for the rest of our lives when listening to arguments. Here's another argument you can try on your own. Try to reconstruct this argument. Pause the video now. This argument in standard form this. Conclusion, we must not belittle socialist ideology because there are only two viable ideologies, bourgeois or socialism. If we belittle socialist ideology, we strengthen bourgeois ideology. We must not strengthen bourgeois ideology. You'll notice the text in green above is the stuff that we don't really need for this argument. This is the stuff that we can cut out. How about this argument? Now to help you with this argument, it's important to not only find the conclusion, but cut away all the stuff that we don't need. Pause the video now to work on it. Okay, so I mentioned that the first step here is to find the conclusion and cut out what we don't need. For this argument, 
the conclusion is going to be something along the lines of there is a resurrection of the dead, or Christ has risen. What we don't need is everything in green. This is all just fluff that makes no uh, contribution to the argument. So when we get rid of it, we can see that this is left. And when this is left, we find our argument is essentially what follows. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ did not rise. If Christ did not rise, then our preaching and, our, and your faith is in vain. Our preaching and your faith is not in vain. Therefore, Christ did rise. And there is a resurrection of the dead. So here we have kind of two conclusions, either one being fine. Here's another practice. Pause the video now. So this argument, the conclusion is going to be there is some one thing that we choose for its own sake, the chief good. The reason for that, for, Arist uh, yeah, for Aristotle, is that if we choose everything for the sake of something else, then our desire is empty in vain. Our desire is not empty in vain. The idea of eudaimonia or human flourishing and happiness.